If you're a child, please find your parent, come and sit down with your parents so that you can start the service with them. Um, we have children's groups this morning, so shortly through the service, we're going to take the children out to the church hall. If you're a parent, please take your children across the church hall and uh, afterwards collect them as well. Um, it's really important. Um, we do video this service so that people who can't be here can watch it. Um, anything on this platform here will be videoed, so if you have concerns about that, then please um, just uh, try and stay away from this area. Uh, we're here because we believe in and we want to worship God, so let's try and get into that um, attitude of worship. Um, my name's Jonathan, I'm a reader here at Christ Church Stannington. Um, that means the bishop thinks I'm okay to lead services. Are we ready, Carolyn? So, one of the things that I was conscious of as, as we come together is often, you know, we can have a bit of a mess of a week. We can be struggling with all sorts of problems. Maybe our kids, maybe uh, balancing the family budget, maybe um, all sorts of troubles at work or uh, elsewhere. Um, and it just, it's really helpful for us to uh, gather our thoughts and to focus on God if we can just be aware of all those things and uh, bring them to God. And this, this is a verse from Matthew, and this is Jesus talking, and he says, Take my yoke and put it on you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest. For the yoke I will give you is easy, and the load I will put on you is light. So I just want us to consciously let those words sink into us, and let's think of how all these struggles that we've had through the week, if we gather them all up, and we just give them to Jesus, and in exchange he's going to give us something light, something easy. And then if we have the next one. But the time is coming. This is Jesus speaking again. The time is coming and is already here when by the power of God's spirit, people will worship the Father as he really is, offering him the true worship that he wants. God is spirit and only by the power of his spirit can people worship him as he really is. So now that we've taken those struggles, those difficulties, and offered them up, let us receive from God the spirit that enables us to worship him in truth. Would you like to lead us in worship? Shall we stand together? My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing
chains are gone just one more time my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a fly his mercy reigns Unending love, amazing grace. Yes, Father, thank you for the truth of that song. Lord, thank you that you've rescued us and you've restored us. And Lord, we can stand in that freedom today. And, and Lord, that's even more poignant as we head towards Holy Week and Easter. Thank you, Father, that we can be in this place, Lord, that we can worship together in freedom. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, we're going to have a family worship song now. And because it went down so well, the last time I called the guys that were helping with the actions, backing dancers, we would love to invite the backing dancers to the stage. So this is, um, won't be familiar to church, but it's really familiar to the kids. The kids have been doing this in kids' groups for ages now, and they love it. So kids, you need to sing better than the adults. Yeah, we did an amazing concert here last night, and the sound in this place was, was superb. So no pressure. Your 
glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light shine so that men might see your good deeds. And glorify your Father in heaven. Sha la la, sha la la, sha la 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 la. Sha la la, sha la la, sha la 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 la. So let your light shine so that men might see your good deeds. Glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light shine so that men might see your good deeds. And glorify your Father in heaven. Thank you. So, as we're moving through the service, let's move into an attitude of confession. And we're going to have this prayer, which will help us think of the things that we may have done wrong uh, to others and to God, and process that. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Let's say it together. Be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Let us confess our lack of love and our need of grace. When we lose patience, when we are unkind, when we are envious, when we are rude or proud, when we are selfish or irritable, and when we will not forgive, have mercy on us, O God. Help us not to delight in evil, but to rejoice in the truth. Help us always to protect, to trust, to hope and to persevere. Then shall we see you face to face and learn to love as you love us. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Right, if the children would like to come forward and then we're going to have a quick prayer. We're going to pray for each other and then we'll send the children out to their groups and parents, please take the children with you. Do you want to come up? We're going to have a quick prayer. <laughs> now then, I ask this quite regularly and I it's not always possible to find someone who's brave enough to say a prayer for the parents. Are there any children here who would like to say a quick prayer for the parents? Yeah, it just has to be something simple like, God, I pray that you'll be with the parents while we're out in our groups. Something like that. Does anyone want to take the mic? Please God. Please God, make all the parents be happy and we all can keep safe if there's any more floods. Amen. 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 Did you want to say something? <laughs> You're thinking about it. <laughs> is the only one that gets to go with Dad and, he, and Dora. Yeah. Go on, go to Dad. <laughs> Lord, we just thank you for the children. We just want to bless them. And uh, we ask you that you'll pour your love on them. Did you want to say something? And that you'll look after them as they go out to the groups. And as we learn here, we just ask that we'd all learn separately, but the same things. Amen. Did you want to say My mom always does something to me. To, I pray it, mommy and dad, because it's so much fun. Now it's a great. Oh, that's lovely. Go on then. 
Thank you. Right, if you'd like to take your children out to the back and then across the church hall, the young people are going to be going across to the vicarage with the youth leaders. Nick's just going to come and talk to us for a few minutes. We thinned out, sorry. We thinned out, haven't we? Um, I was going to share some notices, and I'll have, I think we'll have to do this one again. Um, in fact, maybe John, if you remember anything of what I say, you can repeat it when some of the parents come back in, because one of the things I was going to mention is about an all-age prayer stations thing happening on Good Friday. So there's various events happening on, Good Fr- on uh, Holy Week, which is coming up starting next Sunday. Um, and one of them I wanted to highlight, and this is all in the weekly mailing, there's also flyers at the back which describe what's happening in, um, in Holy Week. On Good Friday, between 10 and 12, we're going to have some brilliant, I know they'll be brilliant, um, interactive prayer stations around the outside of church. They're going to help us enter into the story of following Jesus to the cross. So I'm really hopeful that's going to be a great time. So come um, any age, uh, come as a family, come as an individual and just engage, use that as a time to engage interactively um, with the story of, um, of Holy Week. Um, and uh, there'll be various points in that where we're going to gather together inside to worship as well. But the idea is you can come along any time between 10 and 12 um, and just spend about sort of half an hour, as long as you want really, um, engaging with that. Um, the rest, as I say, is in the, um, the flyer or in the weekly mailing. One other thing I wanted to point out, a couple of other things. One is that next week there won't be Forest Church. So on this paper sheet it says it's Forest Church. I think in the weekly mailing it doesn't, but there won't be Forest Church next Sunday because we're going to do an all-together um, morning Good Friday service. Um, and the prayer stations thing is sort of replacing that. Um, also then to mention um, the following Sunday, Easter Day, we'll have our six, we'll have a 6 a.m. sunrise service. We'll then have some pastries. Anyone can come along who's feeling brave for the uh, getting up that early. Uh, and then we'll have a nine o'clock service as usual. And then after the nine o'clock service, from 10, we're going to have a breakfast together, a bit like last year, breakfast on an Easter egg hunt. So do come along, join us for that. And then that means the 10.30 service will be pushed back to 11. So we'll have a service at six, a service at nine, breakfast and egg hunt at 10, and then the later service starting at 11. Um, and then the one other thing, in fact, I'll let you do that. You're going to talk about Alpha, aren't you? Yeah, you guys are going to... Great. I'll let you guys um, say about Alpha. So I think then, that's the only other thing, the only other thing to say is um, that we have magazines still waiting to be delivered. So if you're able and up for doing some magazine deliveries, please do. You can, um, as you ex- exit these doors on the left, there is a table. You can grab a wad of magazines and you can write down or tick off um, yeah, where, you're, where you're delivering. That would be great. I'm just looking at Luke and I'm also thinking there's prayer walking going on, isn't there? So Monday, 8.30 p.m. tomorrow. Is that the last one or second to last one? Second to last, great. It's two more Mondays, 8.30 p.m. Meeting just outside, outside the front here. Um, 8.30 p.m. for a prayer walk. Do join us. Um, cool, thank you. Back over to you. We've got another song, I believe. If you'd like to stand. Loving kindness as the flood 
where the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood who his love will not remember who can cease to sing his praise he can never be forgotten throughout hell's eternal day On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy, float a vast and gracious tide. Oh, grace and love like mighty rivers, poured in and from above, and heaven's and perfect justice kiss the guilty world in love let me all thy love accepting worship you for all my days let me seek thy kingdom only let my life to alone shall be my glory nothing in this world I'll see you have cleansed and sanctified me you alone have set me free and you alone shall be my glory nothing in this world I'll see you have cleansed and sanctified Nothing in this world I'll see. Yes, you have planned and sanctified me. You alone have set me free. Could we have our first reading, please? Our gospel reading. Our reading this morning comes from John chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. Jesus predicts his death. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. So Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this reason I came to this house, this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. 
Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on the world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Mark is going to come and talk to us. Morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Shall we pray? So, Jesus, we thank you for your word. We pray now that by your spirit you would open that word into our lives to help us to live according to your will and purposes for the sake of your name. Amen. In a passage from John's Gospel this morning, we see Jesus articulating the inner struggle that he had to go the way of the cross. And we see this played out later in the Synoptic Gospels, in Matthew, Mark and Luke, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus, of course, overcomes that struggle and freely walks towards the cross in order to defeat the power of evil and to save us. And here in John 12, we get yet another reminder from Jesus that if we want to follow him, we too have to pick up our own cross. We too will face struggles. And I want to uh, focus particularly on this morning on verses 25 and 26, if we've got those. So it says, those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me so that my servant will be with me where I am and my father will honour anyone who serves me. This is the cross-shaped way which we've been thinking about during Lent. And it's easy to say, but it's much more difficult to do. What exactly does it mean to walk the cross-shaped way? What does it mean when Jesus said, those who follow him have to pick up their cross? Well, Paul wrote a lot about this when he talked about choosing to live according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. The Spirit, he says, brings life, but the flesh brings death. And in Galatians 5, he tells us to make a deliberate effort to choose the fruit of the Spirit. You know the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He's telling us to choose to live that way. To live that way brings life. But the opposite, which he calls the flesh, brings death. And he calls this the sinful nature. Things like impurity, hatred, discord, jealousy, sexual immorality, and selfishness. These things are about putting me first, satisfying my own desires. And Paul says when we do that, we become a, slavery to the, a slave to those things. We become slaves to sin. They become our idols. The sort of quick fixes we turn to, you know, when you've had a bad day or you're just not feeling right and you turn to those things to give you a quick fix. But you know somehow deep inside 
that it's not a life-giving thing. It's not living by the Spirit. And the problem is, whether it's good or bad, that the things we choose then start to shape us. Let me say that again. The things we choose start to shape us. And that's a biological truth, and it's also a theological truth. Now, put your hand up if you can drive. Quite a lot of you. That's great. I hope we don't have here the UK record holder for the person who took the most driving tests before they were allowed on the road. Uh, anybody beat 48? <laughs> Someone's looking at Michelle. I'm sure you didn't have 48, Michelle. <laughs> okay. 48, that's not bad, is it? But that's nowhere near the world record for the number of tests before someone passed. Anyone who guessed what that number might be who wasn't in the first service? It's 950, 950 tests before they pass. Now that is persistence for you, isn't it? I'm pretty expensive as well. Someone desperately wanted to drive. Put your hand up now if you can or you ever could ride a bike. That's almost everyone, that's uh, impressive. And then uh, most people, unless they're disabled or, uh, uh, you know, something's happened to them or they've uh, lost the ability through age, but most people can walk. And the thing, all those three things have got in common, and I caught Johnny's eye now, he'll tell me this is wrong, uh, but I'm sure it's right, is muscle memory. That actually we teach ourselves to do things and then we start to do it automatically through muscle memory. So if you think about when you learn to drive or when you like to, to ride a bike or, you know, I've got uh, lots of grandkids now and watching them learn to walk is hysterical, isn't it? You know, the first steps, they take a few and then they collapse and then they get up and do it again. And in all those things, it's persistence. It's doing it again and again and again until it becomes almost automatic. So to start with, you know, remember learning to drive. It feels a bit like it's somewhere outside of you. You're having to think about doing all these different things at the same time. I remember when I first uh, learned to drive, I can vividly remember in my dad's car sort of thinking, can I get out of this place? Because I was going down the road and it was kangarooing down the road. So I clearly got it in the wrong gear, but I had no idea how to sort it out. Uh, you make mistakes, it's somewhere out there. But then when you get used to it, it's like you've internalized it. You do it without thinking about it. It's just become part of who you are. And biologists tell us that that's how it is with our behavior. Our behavior starts to shape us too. We do these things almost automatically and it shapes the person we become. Whether it be choosing the things of the spirit, the good things, or the bad things. And uh, you know, if you think about the bad things, the things you know you shouldn't turn to. It starts off maybe once or twice. You know, it's out there somehow, you can control it, you're in control of it. But then you do it again and you do it and again. And before long, as soon as something goes wrong, you start to go for it automatically. You know, and I'm talking about these things that you tend to do when you're on your own, maybe the things you do in the dark, maybe the things that you're not so proud of. But if you're not careful, it can become part of your muscle memory. You know, you don't turn, and I'm speaking to myself now, and uh, uh, reflecting what my kids sometimes say about me, you don't turn into a grumpy, cynical old man overnight. If you keep on choosing to respond in a grumpy or a cynical way, before long you become a grumpy, cynical person. You've got to check yourself and respond in a different sort of way. And similarly, if you keep on responding with love and kindness, you become more of a loving and a kind person. I remember an exercise um, I did years ago. I've still got the post-it in the front of uh, my sort of uh, diary. Um, 
to uh, write a few sentences about what you want people to say about you when you've gone. What do you want your kids to say about you? What do you want your work colleagues to say about you? What do you want other people to say about you? And I wrote something like, you know, Mark is kind and loving. You know, he cares for us. He helps us. Those sort of things. That's the sort of person I wanted to become. But it doesn't happen overnight. And I'm a long way from that yet. You've got to practice these things. And, you know, this reading, this Lent, I'm reading a book by a, a guy called John Mark Comner. And he's quite interesting because he says that this biological truth is also a theological truth. It's the same as the doctrine of sanctification. By choosing to live according to the Spirit, we slowly become more and more like Jesus. We become Jesus-shaped. That's what sanctification is. And this is really challenging stuff, isn't it? You know, am I living that cross-shaped life? Am I making good choices which, like muscle memory, become part of who I am? And there's a cost to this because it can be painful. It's sometimes about denying ourselves, not necessarily doing what we want to do. Sometimes it means making the difficult choice. That was shown to us perfectly with Jesus in Gethsemane. Was he going to run? Was he going to cop out? Or was he prepared to go the way of the cross? And of course, that's the way he chose to go, to glorify God and to save us. But it was a struggle. And if it was a struggle for Jesus, it's going to be a struggle for us. And part of the problem is this is what I'm talking about is so counter-cultural. You not hear anything I've been saying so far on telly in the adverts, will you? It'll not be, you know, don't bother spending an extra 10 grand on this car. You know, use it for your family. And, uh, you know, cope with that clapped out old car for a bit longer. It's still running. You don't hear that on television, do you? And, you know, it's, you don't hear, well, deny yourself. You hear, if it feels right, do it. You know, what's this Nike slogan? Just do it. You're free to choose whatever makes you happy, providing it doesn't harm anyone else. Well, the bad news, guys, as followers of Jesus, is that's not what Jesus taught. You know, Tim Keller, one of the most insightful Christian writers on culture, put it like this, if we've got that uh, a little uh, quote upon the screen. He says that freedom is not what culture tells us. Real freedom comes from a strategic loss of some freedoms in order to gain others. It's not the absence of constraints but it's choosing the right constraints and the right freedoms to choose. Jesus used even less words to say much the same thing. The person who loves his life will lose it, while the person who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So the reward is eternal. But the struggle is real. And please be clear here, I'm not saying that through our own willpower, through our own determination to do the right thing, we can earn our own salvation. That is not what the Bible says. That is one for us only through Christ alone on the cross. But I am saying that the choices we make whether to live according to the flesh or according to the spirit, shapes the person we become. And you know, even more amazingly, it shapes the world around us. Not just who we become,
but the impact we have on the wider world. Just been singing that lovely uh, children's song, haven't we, about becoming a light, a light to shine that other people might see for Jesus' way. And you know, one of our uh, theological heavyweights, uh, a guy called Tom Wright, in his book Surprised by Hope, put it like this. I love this uh, uh, quote. It's quite a long one, but bear with me. And this is about choosing the right things, living according to uh, the spirit, not the flesh. He says this, you are not planting roses in a garden that's about to be dug up to become a building site. You are, strange though it may seem, almost as hard to believe as the resurrection itself, accomplishing something that will become, in due course, part of God's new world. Every act of love, of gratitude, of kindness, every work of art or music inspired by the love of God and delight in the beauty of creation, every minute spent, spent teaching a severely handicapped child to read or to walk, every act of care and nurture, of comfort and support for one's fellow human beings, and for that matter, one's fellow non-human creatures, and of course, every prayer or spirit-led teaching, every deed which spreads the gospel, builds up the church, embraces and embodies holiness rather than corruption, and makes the name of Jesus honored in this world. All of this will find its way through the resurrection power of God into the new creation which God is building when his kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. What he's saying in lots of words is it makes a difference. When we choose to try and live God-shaped lives, not only does it make a difference to us, it makes a difference to the world around us. And finally, if all of this feels a bit daunting, if it feels that the bar's been set a bit high, it's too difficult for us to live up to this. In John's Gospel, supremely, John depicts the Holy Spirit flowing from the cross of Jesus. In the other Gospels, very often the Holy Spirit comes a bit before that, but in John's Gospel, he's clear. It flows from the cross into the world and into our lives so that we are empowered to live God-shaped lives. If we turn to him and we ask for the power of his Holy Spirit living in our lives, then we can choose the right way. You know, sometimes it means having to pause. We know when we're doing the wrong stuff. Just pause. Say, God, help me. God, help me. Because, you know, you can't do this stuff on your own. You can't do it, particularly the really difficult things we struggle with. You need something higher than yourself, beyond yourself. And you know, this is well known in, uh, in the sort of counselling world. Uh, the alcoholic, Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step plan makes it very clear. So in this 12-step plan, uh, stage one is to admit you've got a problem. You can't get anywhere unless you actually recognise you've got a problem. But stage two, the very next stage, is to believe in a higher power above your own self. And amazingly, even in our secular culture, that is still in the 12-step plan. It might not necessarily be asking people to choose a Christian God, but it's talking about a higher power because you cannot do this thing on your own. We have that higher power flowing from the cross and living inside each and every one of us to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. To choose Jesus. To ask him to help us by his Spirit to equip us to choose the right way. Choose life and become the person who we have been created to be for all eternity. That's 
what it means to walk the way of the cross, to choose the Jesus way. So shall we pray? And Lord, we want to confess again that we know we get this wrong. None of us, I suspect, believe we're perfect. Many of us believe we've got a long way to go. Maybe it's that um, knee-jerk, hurtful response when we should bite our tongue. Maybe it's uh, a grudge we hold. Possibly for years. Maybe it's the things we turn to which we know actually have got more of a hold on our lives than they should be. They're no longer external. They've become part of who we are. The things we turn to first when we're struggling or stressed. And Lord, we don't want to live like that. We want to choose kindness, self-control. We want to choose you. We want to become the people you've created us to be. And so we confess, Lord, our weakness. And we thank you that in our weakness, you give us your strength, strength beyond our own. So, Lord, now, as we lay these things down, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Where we're stubborn, like in the AA pledge, first of all, help us to accept we have a problem. But secondly, to recognize that there is a higher power who can help. So pour out your Spirit upon us. Bless us, Lord. Equip us, Lord. Strengthen us, Lord. That we might live our lives for you and make our world a better place. Holy Spirit, just come. Just come. And thank you, Lord, that um, there is no guilt, there is no shame. Only forgiveness. Just like um, the image I had in our first service was uh, like a toddler learning to walk keep, who keeps on falling down and yet gets up again. We pick that toddler up and they try again. And that's how it is with God. We might keep on stumbling and falling, but God picks us up. And he says, I love you. I love you. Try again. Try again. So thank you for that, Lord. There is no condemnation. And just ask these things in Jesus' name. Let's just stay in the attitude of prayer and uh, reflection as we think about what Mark said. And if you feel that God has spoken to you through something Mark said, I'd like you to focus on that and just um, think around how you can implement what you feel God has said to you through this week, through Easter, through the, the month to come. So just spend some time thinking about that. If you don't have something particular that you're thinking of, then I would encourage you just to think about how you, um, how you live out that concept of self-sacrifice, of uh, putting others, of putting God first. So just spend some time thinking through those things.
Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to follow you, the opportunity to lay down the things we want, our own desires, our own uh, selfish needs, and to focus on you and on each other. And in doing so, that you give us true life, 